This meeting is being recorded. Brilliant. Good evening, everybody. Um, following a very successful private view a couple of weeks ago now for our first ever 3D exhibition in our virtual gallery. Um, delighted to welcome back Kath Stocker, our curator, and some of the artists to share more insights and details and information about their practice and what inspired them to participate in this particular exhibition. Um, and also have a conversation with Kath um, as to how the how the two sort of worlds sort of collided um, to actually create the, the the big picture of what the exhibition is, but then sort of honing down into the individual artworks as well. It's a beautiful exhibition. Um, I am incredibly proud of it. The work that Kath and our um, exhibition designer Tom Dale put in to actually um, deliver this exhibition is, is mind blowing and in quite a short sort of turnaround and, and time as well. Um, I think a few people who were here at the private view sort of heard me sort of say that we weren't sure if it could be done. Um, and to talk to Tom to see whether or not he had the gumption maybe <laughs> or bravery, I'm going to say, as opposed to, um, yeah, not really thinking about it too much to say, yes, we can do it, let's get on with it, um, was just wonderful. It, it sort of instilled a confidence and an energy, I think both in Kath and myself, um, as we sort of embarked on this on this process. And I just love it when you find people to work with who have such generous energy, actually, and understand the vision and what it is that you want to try and achieve. So this is a bit of a shout out to Tom Dale at um, 3D60. Um, if you are not following him on Instagram, then please do. You can access him through our, our CAN account. Um, we do quite a few shout outs to him because we're a bit of a fan. And um, yeah, to, for him to then sort of deliver the practical side of Cat's vision um, and all of the artists work together has been an amazing sort of first step. And I think which is going to be a, 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 pro, a process for us um, as we explore the 3D world virtually. Um, as we explore the opportunities and possibilities, um, everything is a learning process, everything we do for art can is. And what I love about all the artists that are involved as well, the fact that they are part of that journey and that part of that learning process and that educational knowledge share that we're all embarking on. Um, it, it's, it's humbling, but it's also really exciting. So thank you to all the artists who are involved as well. Um, Kath, leader extraordinaire, pulling it all together. Um, and I don't think I really need to say much more. The exhibition speaks for itself. You can go on to our virtual gallery via the website. You can immerse yourself in this amazing space um, with the works and you'll see a lot more of it this evening um, and the artists behind it. So thank you all for being here this evening. It's really a delight for me to immerse myself in this occasion with you too and hear all the words as well, because I don't know that much either. Um, so with no further ado, it's over to you, Kath. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everybody. Um, before we get stuck into the conversations, I just wanted to do a quick recap on the curatorial theme, uh, artivism, mixture of art activism, um, but with another lens. Um, so I asked all the artists to think about something that was important to them um, that would like to draw their audience in and show them a perspective they may not have considered before, um, where the art becomes about sort of communication, a means of communication. Um, through change and transformation. And so to give that, that kind of lens, I added the insight, artivism insight, and that could be interpreted um, as the artists have done. Um, and, and really to have, I said this at the private view, to have insights about something, you've got to really deeply understand something. And to deeply understand something, you need to listen, you need to look, and you need to hear um, and have empathy. You know, it's really important. So um, what this exhibition isn't, it isn't about first impressions. Um, it requires the audience to look and listen as well and to try and have some empathy to understand and change their perceptions. Um, and so it's not about those first impressions. Um, and I just want to say that um, the reason I chose the work and the artists for this, this show was I really wanted to have a real diverse um, a range of voices. Um, that was really, really important, um, and also a diverse range of styles. So there was equilibrium, there's balance in the show, 
Um, I took great care in um, choosing the wall colours, the plinths, the placements, the heights, the space between all of the work. Um, the relationship between the works, if artists had two pieces, where they were placed, um, the lights, the flooring, the terrazzo flooring, um, and, and also the soundscape as well. So if you hasn't, haven't had the sound switched on yet, I really recommend it, um, at least for one experience. And um, so, so yes, yeah, so uh, I just want to say thanks again to ArtCan and especially to, to Kate Enters and to all of the trustees and trusting me with this, curating this exhibition because, um, you know, it was a might've been a challenge, but it's come together really well. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I'd just like to, to, to sort of kick off by um, introducing, um, let me just, uh, to walk, let's walk around, I'll share my screen and then that will make a bit more, bit more sense. Um, okay. Um, can that, can everybody see the art can here with the enable audio? Yeah. Is that yes? Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to put audio on this time. When I did the private view, it was quite loud. So, um, so yeah. So I'm just uh, I'm just going to just sort of enter the exhibition here. And we've got this wonderful uh, sculpture by Heather Burwell. And um, uh, so Heather Burwell's practice, just very briefly, because obviously she wants to, to tell you about her practice, is developed from a need to understand what it is to be human and what makes us who we are and how we function with social, within social and familiar settings. Um, and Heather, we're looking here at um, I Become, um, and I know that you're a painter and a sculptor, um, which is really interesting. Um, I've since learned that this is um, a collaboration between you and other artists, so I'll let you tell a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but what I found about your work, really, and both the sculptures we've got in the exhibition, is how emotive they are. I mean, straight away, you know, there's a relationship there. There's, you, you just can't help but, and you sort of, there's a conversation that comes out of that. And I'm sure that conversation will be different for everybody. So I'm really curious to know more about the relationship in these sculptures and why you created the pieces in 3D, um, but also about the, the, uh, the meaning behind this and your collaboration. So hand over to you, Heather, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kath. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been sculpting and painting uh, for a long time really um, and yeah you're right um, the description that I'd like to explore what it means to be human um, so I'm interested I'm interested in what makes us tick um, you know and how this affects our life experiences um, and the work itself um, I'm more interested in things that are hidden so I'm interested um, in the things behind the things that we don't see and the things and the words that we don't say. So within the work, in both my paintings and in my sculpture, um, they kind of act as a stage really to present everything, but I'm also trying to hide it at the same time. Um, so obviously on first glance, you might see what you want to see, but then when you further explore the work, it's my intention and, and my hope is that you see more to that than what was first thought. Um, so this particular piece um, was a response really to, um, to mental health. Um, and I think in the last couple of years in particular, we've all, you know, that's been a lot of focus for all of us, hasn't it? And um, it's highlighted really the importance of kind of our well-being um, and our need to maybe nurture and protect ourselves. Um, so this piece came about um, when I was at uni um, last year doing my master's. Um, and with one of my colleagues, Heather Kerwin, um, also a fellow artist who's a poet as well. Um, so she shared some poems with me that really resonated with the piece that I was working on. Um, so I wanted to kind of show that, that, you know, she's, she's kindly agreed to read the poem out to you tonight. Um, and really it's her, you know, how everyone interprets mental health in different ways and how they find healing in different ways. So that was kind of the thinking behind this piece. Great, Heather. Would you like me to read it or? 
Sorry. Yeah, so if, yeah, so Heather Kerwin, that'd be great if you could read the poem. Okay. Thank well, thank you, Heather, and thank you, everyone, for making part of your talk tonight. Uh, the poem is called I Become Nature. I shout at the wind. It tears the words from my throat, leaving me husk-like, waiting to be filled. Crow sits on my windowsill, calling me from sleep. His hand steadies me as I climb onto the ledge. I spread my wings and fly. I lie on the ocean bed as if sleeping, my head pillowed in sand. Creatures make homes in my hollows. We are one, the ocean and I. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. You both, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Two Heather. <laughs> um, and, uh, Thank you so much, Heather Cohen. That was beautifully uh, a beautiful poem and beautifully read. And um, so, so Heather Burwell, why two D and why three D? What, why, why have you chosen to? Why do you choose to present? You know, either. Um, I guess people react to them in different ways. Um, within a painting, what I normally do is there's a narrative of works. Um, so then I'll work on a series of work and then them all as a whole become something else. So individually they might say something, but then as a whole series of work read together, they then have the whole story. Um, so you, but when you, and you're just looking at that one visual image um, and you still feel something, but I think with a sculpture, you walk around it and you interact with a sculpture in a completely different way to what you do with a 2D image. So again, um, you know, you can do that in painting as well. I mean, at the moment, I'm trying to merge the two um, because I felt that they were quite separate. I started off as a painter working in a narrative way, and then I'm trying to get that into one 3D image. But now I'm, I'm playing about with the both of them, that I want an interaction between 3D and 2D. So I'm playing about with, does, two, does a painting have to be on a wall? Or can that be um, approached in the same way as you would approach a 3D piece? So I've just recently done a hanging piece, um, which is then central in the room. So you can walk around that and interact with that in the same way. So you just get a different sense, I think, personally, when, you, when it's in a 3D format. As I walk through upstairs, because um, I'd like to just end on your other sculpture upstairs and then we can go to Richard because I know you both have got commitments tonight. So, um, uh, so we we'll just, and you need to get off. So we just arranged the running order slightly differently, which is fine, it's absolutely fine. So it's quite nice that we've got both your sculptures outside. I hope you didn't mind that. I just- Yeah, no, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, we increased the size of the balcony for your sculptures, for these two sculptures, <laughs> to give them space. And, you know, it was really important to do that. Yeah, um, thank you. It looks great against the, um, the background, doesn't it? Yeah, this is more details that really, to set the work off, it's really important. And, you know, like Kate said, Tom's been amazing working with me to, to, uh, to create the vision that I had for, for the show. So here we have drifting. And uh, I'm really interested in the materials you use, oxidized plaster and clay. I realise we've got quite a few people to go through, but I just wanted to, just to, to, to this is such a lovely piece as well. Really wonderful. Did you have anything you wanted to say, you felt like you needed to uh, say, Heather, that you haven't said yet, or are you- um, Only that this is a slightly, it's all on the same theme, but it's uh, it's a bit more of a personal piece, really, because it was a response to um, an issue in my own personal life um, where my ex-husband had a breakdown and, um, and it was hidden for quite a while. That kind of depression was hidden for a very long time. Um, so this piece is a response to that, really. It was helping me make sense of what was going on at the time. So it's two people that are, that are together but drifting apart. And there's this, this kind of space in between that um, is difficult to fill with, um, without proper communication, really. So, so yeah, this was uh, another um, 
you know, another story where something was hidden. Um, um, and on first glance, you, it might might just appear that two people are walking apart, but there's more to that story, if that makes sense. That's really powerful. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Okay, um, perhaps we'll save for questions till the end, unless anyone's got any, a burning question for Heather, because I know that Heather has to go and teach soon. Um, so if you do, please say now otherwise we'll move on to Richard because I know Richard's also got to got to leave early as well any questions for Heather okay thank you so much Heather it's been absolutely fantastic to have have your work in this show it's really it's been great and uh, I love the, the 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 way you talked about um 2D and 3D and uh and experiencing those different um types of work um and where your work is going it's really interesting thank you so much Thank you, Kath. It's brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we've got quite handy <laughs> walking around this exhibition, as you can imagine. Uh, but there's a door, there's a block, there's a window there, right? Um, so Richard Payton uses kinetic mechanical gestures to explore the science and culture of magnetic fields, with the aim of generating poetic visual metaphor. I'm really interested in learning more about this. Um, I've got some questions here, actually. If you just bear with me, Richard. Um, you're in a different order here. Yes, yeah, so um, let me just get to, to one of them here. Right, here we go. Um, your sculptures, um, they're really intriguing. Um, they're almost, I mean, I, I shouldn't give too much of my own um, opinion about the work because I don't like it to color other people's, but um, I found them very intriguing and almost museum-like uh, pieces um, with, with, a, with a, a, a certain tension. Um, um, I would really love to see these physically, um, but I think it's amazing that we can actually, you know, spin them round. But I'd be really interested to know, can you tell us more about how they were put together, how they work, and the message that they give? Um, and we're looking at this one um, as, um, this one is Jolt. <clears throat> yep. Richard, thank you, thank you. Hi everyone, evening everyone. Um, yeah, this one, um, uh, where do we start? It's a balloon which is made out of metal. And it's 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 floating in space, and it's being pulled by a magnetic field, um, by a magnet which is built into the frame at the top. And when it works, which is on the hour, because it behaves like a clock as well, which you can't get from this, um, the base lifts by about a centimeter, and then drops very abruptly, and therefore jolts and makes the balloon wobble in the and and doesn't quite break the magnetic field. So, um, and at the same time, the balloon is spinning. So there are two motors in the base, one which lifts the base and jolts it, and the other one which spins like um, uh, a planet. So um, yeah, I've put some electronics in there so that uh, it behaves like a clock as well. So all my sculptures, apart from the other one in this exhibition, um, are mechanical and they all have moving parts and they come on on the hour um, for about 30 seconds to a minute, depending on, uh, how much people can bear when they're invigilating. <laughs> so, um, that's how that one works. Um, <clears throat> and it's called Jolt. There isn't, um, it's open to interpretation. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's quite visceral when people don't um, know what it is and it's in an exhibition setting. Um, people are quite surprised that it's actually moving and then suddenly does something. But there is a button on this so you don't have to wait for the hour to strike before um, <laughs> before it comes on so you can see it working. So um, that one's called Jolt. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and the other one is about something, <laughs> Arc of the Sun. So the idea of this, my, my work has always been about um, environmental issues. And most recently I've tagged my interest in science and magnetic fields with um, uh, uh, my concerns for environmental issues. Um, and the link is magnetoreception. So humans and animals, uh, well, we're all connected to the earth um, and animals migrate. And one of the things that they're able to navigate by is a thing called magnetoreception. So they can um, literally know which way is north and which way is south. Uh, and that's um, built into the, the, uh, the mag uh, eye mechanism. Um, so they can literally see it. And um, 99 
more than 99% of all species that have been tested for magnetoreception in laboratories have shown to have this uh, ability to know um, which is north, which is south. So they have a connection to the earth. Humans, on the other hand, don't have this um, magnetoreception. We've lost it. And this was proven in tw uh, 2019 conclu conclusively. And there was quite a big body of evidence and they published a paper and um, basically we've lost our connection to the earth, literally and metaphorically. So this piece is it's a little bit small. You can't really see what's going on. So what we have is a mythic boat, an ark. It's called the Ark of the Sun. Um, and there's a direct reference to um, Noah's Ark, of course. Um, but it's also got this mythical kind of um, uh, dimension to it in the shape of the boat. It's made of copper. Um, there's a piece of glass underneath. It does turn around on, on, on the plinth as well, but that's not mechanized. And um, what we have also is uh, a sundial um, inside the boat, which, uh, and there's a gnomon, which is the, um, the, uh, the, the, the kind of rod sticking out of the boat. And on the end of that is a rock called a lodestone. And the lodestone has been calibrated so that it, there's a little red dot on it and it points north. And this was the earliest form of compass. Um, the Chinese um, used this as a compass 3000 years ago or 3000 BC, sorry. So um, there's, a, there's a reference to people needing a compass um, and animals have magnetoreception. Inside the boat are metal animals, ferrous um, iron animals, all on the red list. They're all about to go extinct. Um, and so this arc of the sun is a kind of reference to, you know, the sun setting on civilization almost. Extinction rates for animals are a hundred times their normal historically. So, and that's exponential. So we're looking at calamity and ecological collapse. You know, I'm a pretty depressing person at parties, so sorry about all this. But um, that's what this is all about. It's, it's our connection to the earth, our disconnection to the earth, magnetoreception, death, extinction, and um, you know, the fact that we're a planet and we're whizzing around the sun. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of layers to it. But it's a shame you can't really see inside the boat. That's it's great that you can spin around it, but you need to be able to literally get closer. Oh, you can zoom in. Well done. I didn't know you could do that. Wow. Um, I didn't know you could do it. I just did it then. <laughs> Amazing. And you can actually see the the um, screws in in the through the. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That was another thing. The, the animals are screwed. A bit obvious. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> Very powerful piece. Lots in there, Richard. Thank you so much. Um, I just love the way that they, they, they take the space as well. Um, they're just two very strong pieces in the exhibition. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. I know that Richard's got to go. Um, so if anyone has a burning question for Richard, please, could you ask it now? Okay Otherwise, now. we'll move on. No? OK, Richard, this has been an absolute pleasure to, to work with you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, we're going to have a trip downstairs again now. Um, Love walking around this gallery, it's brilliant. And we're going to have a look at Jane. Jane Hindmarch's work. So Jane, Jane works in, she draws, she paints, she sculpts, um, and her sculptures explore mood and emotion, evoked and informed by observations of the natural world. Um, so we have Blossom Bud here. Um, I found these, um, uh, what attracted me to these pieces actually was how you could take such a delicate subject and recreate in an abstract form using metal, um, painted metal that draws you in and makes you have a conversation about what it is to be first forming, uh, capturing the essence of life beginning. And so that's kind of, I was really taken by these because it seems such an opposite subject matter, but it's so perfect the way you've expressed um, these, Jane, and I would like to ask you why metal, why aluminium, and please give us any more insights about your work that you'd love to tell us about the work in the exhibition, etc. Thanks, Jane. Oh, thank you very much, Kath. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can now. It was a bit shaky at the beginning, but uh, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, well, thank you. You really sort of hit the nail on the head, actually, because um, what I try to do in these pieces is uh, reduce the sometimes complex elements of drawing down to something very essential. 
And uh, my work in general is about connecting with nature and trying to get across the feeling of um, sort of energy and uh, therapeutic well-being that we get from engaging with nature. Um, so, so in these particular pieces, for example, the blossom bud and the, the leaf bud, um, this is really about trying to sort of pare it down to the essence of an idea in the mind connecting with the physical material, which is what we're all wrestling with, trying to get across that idea and the sort of feeling and emotion and the concept and putting it into the material. So in the simplest way, these are three dimensional drawings where I'm trying to get this sort of energy and the physical movement of a, a fresh sort of sketch and actually put that into a solid three dimensional form. Um, sort of take it off the paper and make it a real thing that you can connect with in three dimensions and handle. And uh, yes, make, make it an object really. Um, I find that the use of these flowing lines in a three dimensional sense are energizing and also very calming. So my work is always to do with balances and contrasts. And uh, those are the two things I'm trying to balance in this particular piece the energy, the dynamic element of, um, well, the energy that comes from nature basically, but also a calming, reassuring effect of following a line and your eye traveling round and round. So the two pieces are really doing the same thing. There's this one piece, Blossom Bud, and uh, the other little green one. They're about 20 centimeters in each dimension. So quite small. Uh, they're part of, a, of a, a larger collection of work called Expressions of Landscape, uh, which is, you can view on my website, it's a series of sculptures that I made last year in 2021. And they are all exploring different elements of the natural world and of, and of landscape in this way. Um, I see. Thanks, Jane. As you've seen, we've sort of played about a bit with the sizing of certain pieces on this show because um, where if we put them at the actual size, it would be quite lost. Um, so um, ho hoping that the artist didn't mind a little bit of flexibility there. That's really, really interesting. I, like I really to want to make a huge one, actually. So that's actually <laughs> <Yeah>. really great. <laughs> Has it inspired you to make bigger ones? <laughs> Well, I have recently made the largest one that I am currently able to make and installed that um, in an outdoor situation yesterday. Um, but I'm, I'm looking into how I might be able to cast these in a bigger, in a bigger scale and make them more, more substantial. Uh, so that's something I'm going to be looking into probably later this year. Exciting. They're, they're really, really, really wonderful pieces um, as all the work in the exhibition. And I just love the relationship between them as well. Um, well. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very excited to be included in this exhibition. And I think it's absolutely mind boggling that the gallery has been created in completely in three dimensions in the virtual world and that you can pick these sculptures up and turn them around as if they're in your hand. I think that's fantastic. Part of the... Um, the, the way that that's been able to have been done is because all the artists have followed the strict photography guidelines. And um, we wouldn't be able to create this if you hadn't done it. So I said it in the private view, I say it again, you know, this wouldn't be here if you hadn't, you know, read the instructions and followed them to a T. For people that are on the call who aren't the artists, they had to photograph the pieces from 20 different, uh, from one, one view in 20 different times all the way around. And then the magic of, um, of Tom to, to cut out the backgrounds, which was no mean feat, actually. That was a lot of work. Um, we weren't sure whether we could do that to start with, but I felt it was a deal breaker. So I'm really glad you found a way. Um, thanks, Jane. That's wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, right, we're going to move on now to Nick. Uh, Nick Gear has two wonderful sculptures here. Um, and um, Nick Gear's practice centers around walking and the exploration of liminal spaces as a meta metaphor for the environmental impact of our culture. Um, so here we've got um, altar fragment. Um, there's um, also Alpha Amiga's other, other uh, sculpture I'll show you in a minute. Um, 
And so I was really interested in your way of making um, and the materials that you use to describe your experiences, Nick. Uh, could you tell us more around these processes, please? Welcome, Nick. Yeah, hi there. So, as you mentioned, uh, starting off, um, I do a lot of walking, and these pieces have come from my walks uh, quite close to where I live, which is quite a liminal place. It's like a space between the urban and the natural worlds. And often these places are where people just discard and dump the everyday. So these pieces uh, have been cast in plaster using uh, bits of car, basically. So plastic from cars just been thrown away and discarded and, and left there to rot away. Well, not rot away, because it just stays there forever, really. Um, so it's like a commentary, really, a commentary between um, the way we use our world and then just uh, blithely discard it. And it's like a way of linking the material of landscape back to our uh, consumerist society, if you like. Um, there's a process in the uh, in my practice, if you like, of alchemy, where something that has been discarded is I, I like to find and use again um, to be uh, transformed, if you like, into beguiling forms that then allow the viewer to interrogate and unpack the sculpture. You can see on the surface as it spins around, it's got these marks, and I sort of liken it to having a language which encompasses my walking and the repetitions of walking. It encompasses um, symbols that we use on maps like contouring. Uh, it encompasses almost like primal inscriptions as if they've been put there by our ancestors talking to us uh, of our you know, present day experiences. So there's quite a bit going on within the surface. Uh, you can also see they are used to gold foil and it's sort of a nod to um, almost religious iconography where they use gold to denote something of, of real worth. And it's sort of, for me, highlighting um, the real worth of landscape, how even if we abuse it, it's something to be treasured and to be valued again and not to be trashed. Um, the titles of the work for me are also always very important. So uh, these two pieces have got quite strong um, Christian religious overtones about how we put uh, value on place and objects. And part of that for me is to reflect on and uh, experience and talk about the spiritual connection I find in landscape of being outdoors, of not being confined. It's a sense of free to be myself. Um, one of the things I've really enjoyed about this exhibition is the soundscape, which I know we can't hear at the moment, but it is actually, I think, very important because um, it brings in the sound of birds and the natural world into this sort of man-made environment. And for me, that just transforms the whole experience because, um, well, it reminds me of obviously of my own walking, but it also importantly just closes uh, the formal man-made space we've got here in the virtual world with its sculptural artifacts, with the issue that's vital to us all, and that's the, the health of our planet. So that juxtaposition for me works really well. And I would encourage everybody just to uh, sample the exhibition and, and hear that soundscape again. Thanks, Nick. Um, maybe I'll play it, at, um, put the sound on at the end. And I really appreciate that because the whole idea about the soundscape is what if, what if we didn't have that? What if we didn't have the bees pollinating? What if we didn't have the birds? What if we didn't have all of this? And so it's exactly to your point there. I really appreciate. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. These are beautiful pieces. They're very, um, I think you say, uh, they're, uh, a very sort of Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth-esque, and uh, they really um, strike a chord. Um, yeah, the, the material of the pieces is, is actually quite important because it does reference people like uh, Henry Moore and in Hepworth. Yeah. They used a lot of plaster in their initial sculpture work. Um, the touchstone and the altarpiece um, has been coloured up 
um, with walnut crystal dye. And that's one of the processes that Henry Moore used because he loved the way that it uh, created uh, a bone patina to the actual plaster work. Uh, again, sort of giving it it's an ancient quality. So um, materiality of landscape and the way then I, I use it is a very important in my, in my practice. It's really interesting. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for thank including you. me in the exhibition. It's been great. It's been great having your work here. Thank you so much. OK, um, I'm going to move on. Um, one of my favourite things in this exhibition, actually, is, is um, um, this piece here. Um, which I don't think Svetlana is going to talk about today, but um, I was quite pleased with the with the red plinth, and I think you were too with the with the black background. So, hopefully, that was a huge success. Um, it really is stunning. It's a stunning piece. Thank you. But we're going to now um, go to uh, Greg. Um, Greg Metzor's practice deals with themes of loss and displacement, injustice and empathy, often incorporating everyday mat uh, materials. Um, so, Greg. Um, We've got here, um, it only hurts if you look at it. Um, I'm really drawn to the themes in your work which resonate with the curatorial theme of insight and understanding. Um, I'm curious to know more about where a work starts and why you selected the materials you have used in these two pieces for the exhibition. Greg, over to you. Um, so th this work is, um, I suppose a piece of bricolage. It's, it's things that I've collected along the way, uh, and I I come back to certain materials over and over again. It's interesting to hear Nick talking about alchemy actually, because lead um, lead plays a, a big role in my work, and of course the alchemists were obsessed with turning it into gold. Um, but I use lead for other reasons because of its association with bullets and. Uh, lead-lined coffins, and it's kind of funereal aspect. Uh, I also constantly use wax. There's lead and wax in both the works that I have on this show. Uh, and then uh, I'm trying to tease out um, some kind of narrative without being explicit. Uh, one of the reasons I stopped painting, apart from the basic fact that I'm an absolutely awful painter, uh, was that I found it very difficult to stop um, trying to, to force a narrative onto a painting. Whereas if you use collected materials, they create their own narrative in a way. So, you know, there's no correct way to read the dashboard's Jesus in this work. There's no real way to explain away the fact that there's a, a black and white photograph of Queen Elizabeth II in it. Um, some of the the reference points, the grid structures, the uh, they sheet iron, th those come from my childhood. I grew up in uh, the north of Ireland uh, in the 1970s and uh, a lot of things were gridded off, boarded up, um, sort of the, you were kept out of spaces, kept in other spaces. So th th there are references to that. The keys, I suppose, are a kind of a, a, a touch of a way out or a promise of a way out. Um, but the, the, the actual formation of a work will dictate what it means to different people. Uh, and it means that it actually relieves me of the burden of trying to form, uh, to fully form a meaning for any of the works. Um, that's really interesting. Really interesting, Greg. Yeah, um, so it, yeah, it, just, it just really resonates with, with, the, with, the, with the theme of the exhibition. I really love, love this piece. Um, would you like to talk about the, um, uh, the piece that we've put on the floor in the corner here? I hope you like the way we um, <laughs> have presented the piece and um, next to the other piece of work. Um, and this one is, um, 11 Silence Bells for Bally Murphy, which is a very powerful piece. Uh, yeah, the, the bells are a kind of different strand of my work, uh, and they really stand apart from everything else. Um, the bells uh, have a, a long tradition in Ireland. Uh, Saints' bells 
uh, are still found occasionally buried in the Irish countryside uh, where they were hidden from the Vikings. Um, and the, 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 the bell was seen as a very powerful, almost mythic thing, uh, probably even before the advent of Christianity. But in the, the sixth century Irish text, um, William Sweeney, Sweeney Astray, uh, Sweeney, who is a, a local Irish chieftain, is driven mad because he takes St. Ronan's bell and throws it into the lake. Um, so th th that, there's an element of that in it, but the real purpose of these bells is to try and give a voice to people who've had that voice taken away from them. Uh, the, the first one I made was, uh, was uh, about a, a young lad called Noah Donahue, who was a, a mixed race child from Belfast, who was very brutally murdered um, a few years ago. Uh, and the police service of Northern Ireland have sought a public immunity interest certificate to stop evidence about his death being released. Uh, so that kind of stopped me in my tracks. And I wanted to do something that would express in some way, his voice, his cry for justice. Uh, so I made a lead bell because bells are meant to ring. And if you make it from lead, it can't do that. Uh, and I filled the bell with wax. Because wax for me has connotations with purity and innocence. And uh, in a practical sense, it also gives a lead bell a little bit of structural integrity. Um, so these are formed from basically from one sheet of lead, uh, which is cut into a pattern and then folded. And that's exactly the same process that uh, medieval bell makers used, um, except that they were working with um, sheet iron. So the, the bell idea has kind of caught on and I've made several sets of bells now, including one to commemorate the victims of Bloody Sunday, which is in the Museum of Free Derry. But the 11 bells for Barry Morf Bally Murphy commemorates uh, another massacre uh, in Belfast, which happened about six months before Bloody Sunday, in which 11 people were shot dead uh, on the day after internment without trial was um, introduced. Uh, so I see someone here asking how big they are. And that's a very important factor because the bells are designed to be picked up. The, the bells are about seven inches tall um, and about three inches deep, and they, they fit into the palm of your hand. And in the case of the, the bells that I made for the Bloody Sunday Trust, the bells have actually been handled by the families of the people killed on Bloody Sunday. Uh, so they're, they're palm prints, their fingerprints have ha, have become part of the work. Uh, and that's something that, that I, I love to see these actually being handled. Uh, the photograph, of course, is of these in a fairly pristine state because these, th these particular ones have never been exhibited. Um, Greg, this is very powerful work. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. There's so many comments on the chat. Um, thanks, thanks for having them. Um, I was actually delighted to see this theme come up for an exhibition because there's so much um, beautiful art uh, and you know, there's so many exhibition themes reflect that beauty and that's wonderful, but my stuff just doesn't fit with that. It's perfect for the show and uh, it's just it's really important and powerful and I'm really proud to have your work in this show. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. Um, we're getting uh, tight on time, but um, we have um, time for uh, a few more artists that I wanted to talk today. Um, Molly being one of them. Um, Molly Lambourne's practice is inspired by history and literature and explores themes of womanhood, self and mundanity. Um, so I, I wrote some notes here, um, uh, Molly, just to... To, 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 to talk to you about it. So in the spirit of the true artivism, which this uh, curatorial theme is, is a big part of actually, 
um, as you know, Greg has just so perfectly uh, articulated with his work. Um, I love the way that you take uh, products we um, may take for granted, we may use every day like plates, which would normally be used as a functional object or even a decorative, uh, a decorative art, um, which draws you in and gives you a message of subverting conventional images um, in favor of protest and communicating something um, not easy perhaps to talk about uh, through, through imagery. I think this is wonderful. So um, just like, I haven't really got a question, but I just wanted to say that that's why this really resonated with me. Thank you, Kath. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, this piece is one of 35 black and white ceramic that forms an installation and each one is powerful on its own and comes with its own story. Um, each one is from a moment of my personal history that becomes abstracted and hopefully with a viewer form something that resonates with you and your own sort of experience with it. Um, this particular debate is about the brutality of the modern world when you have a mental health condition like anxiety or depression and the real world doesn't necessarily want to see you. Um, it doesn't want to hear that you're struggling and it doesn't necessarily want to know about the day-to-day -day reality of, of dealing with those conditions. So in that way, the modern world demands that you keep up with its expectation and that you look for part. And so you'll see most of this plate is quite beautiful, but there's always something very distorted in my drawings and the beauty of my ceramics, I guess, at the time I was very interested in, in writing directly onto them and really just being quite avert with my thoughts and, and feelings and not being afraid to sort of a bit more avert usually you might see my drawings and initially they look very beautiful and you go a bit closer and you might see the figure is the neck's too long or something's wrong about it or maybe the figure is crying. Mm. This piece, um, yes, it's about this idea that we put on this sort of alien suit and um, <laughs> suddenly, we, suddenly we smile and we look and we feel the part that we're meant to be in society and um, also within my work, there's a strong theme of female stories and perhaps necessarily, I guess, these, these ideas of how we're expected to look and, and, and feel as well. So there's that idea. And often I use these sort of idealised, not Disney-like, but cartoonish women. Um, and yeah, I guess um, the other pieces, they're in the um, Royal Scottish Academy at the moment. and. They all sort of sit together and, and the idea is that they wouldn't be in the white walls of a gallery, but you might stumble upon this table of ceramics in a woodland space. Mm. And um, I was really interested in using lots of motifs of flowers because I'm creating this sort of imaginary woodland, um, a bit like an Alice in Wonderland-esque um, scene. Um, so it's a bit of a Mad Hatter's Tea Party and, and you sort of fall into this world and fall into these moments and feelings and in history. And, and the really important thing you mentioned with this plate and a, a plate's not a fine art object. And I really wanted to use these mundane items um, that we might ignore, but I, I kind of imagine a house of all these objects and all these objects are seeing stories um, and these arguments and these, these conversations that we have and they store all of it. They store all this trauma and it's kind of, Placing some of that onto objects. It's very powerful. The 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 way that objects over the years, the history, how how they can collect and absorb all of that. I think that's really interesting. Um, are you still there, Molly? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, you weren't quite. Wasn't sure that. Um, uh, they're very, very powerful pieces and, you know, very personal and, you know, um, thank you for, for sharing with us. Appreciate it. Really great. Thank you so much. Um, moving on, um, Jill Despera. Um, Jill Despera's work explores diverse and sometimes darker, humorous or bizarre aspects of humanity. Um, that's only the tip of the iceberg. So, um, but uh, Jill, I've, uh, I love the use of theatre in your work. 
to communicate deeper, darker themes. Um, can you tell us more about the themes in your work and how you switch between being a commercial sculptor and model maker with fine art practice? Oh, hi. Um, which bit do you want me to talk about first? <laughs> you don't have to talk about any of that or answer any of that, but it was just a springboard for discussion. So really over to you, whatever, however way you would like to talk um, about your work. Thanks, Jill. Hi, all. Um, well, it's hard acts to follow. Um, this piece was um, called Grave Goods. Um, I asked friends and family to choose what they valued most in life. To take them to take with them to the next world so it's sort of calling on the old traditions of obviously taking something into the grave with you um but this is more about it's not really about mortality it's about actually being alive and what gives us our sense of identity and gives us joy in this life um there's some very interesting choices i don't think you can see them all they've all been um gold or silver leaves i mean one friend is taking water um Another friend who is actually one of my muses is in the audience here. Uh, photo album of her children or her family. Um, it's quite a lot of sculpting, painting tools, animals, seeds. Uh, my friend who's a very keen gardener and sort of gardening implements. So it's quite a broad selection of things in this piece. But as I say, it's, it's, it's very much about what gives us joy and our sense of ourselves rather than morbid <laughs> thing about even though mortality does underpin a lot of my work um, I would say that it's more about being alive if that makes sense and this piece um, again is um, Sorry, it's, it's very blue, which is my fault for the photography. Um, they're actually much more sort of black and white grey than that. Um, this was inspired by medieval dance of death, which was a really popular theme in churches. Uh, quite a moralistic, um, finger waggy kind of image. But again, I wanted to make it about, her, you know, identity, uh, diversity, celebration of what makes us so different, um, there's characters through history in there, um, really celebrating individuality. And again, I, again, I think it's got quite a theatrical feel. Thanks, Jill, they're wonderful pieces. Um, and apologies, I, I just took a snippet out of your, your biog there and I know that your work is about so much more and thank you for clarifying with these pieces. I'm sure everyone really appreciates that. They're really wonderful. Um, and the, the, the de intricate detail, it, it was so important to have, um, you know, a balance of, of figurative work with abstract work in this exhibition. And like I said at the beginning, to have a diversity of, of, of a voice. Um, would you like to say anything more or go back to either one um, of the works or shall we? Um, I think I've probably given you a, yeah. well, hopefully I've been uh, giving you a sort of introduction to where, where they both come from. That's but wonderful. Celebratory, I suppose. A bit. <laughs> they certainly look it as well. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so we'll go to, um, uh, just look at my plan here, so bear with me. Yep. Melanie Jordan now. Um, I'm going to go over here and <laughs> so, so Melanie Jordan uses uh, thread-based crafts as, at its core and her work pays attention to maternal ambivalence. Um, not, not all but um, uh, also um, Mel um, your pinkish and I found it just really powerful actually. Um, I found the work uh, uneasy as well, which I, you know, and I said in, in my curatorial notes as well, do we want to just watch or do we want to feel provoked? And, you know, I think this piece is, is the embodiment of this exhibition. So thank you very much and hand over to you to tell us more. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. And it's so interesting actually to hear about um, all the different work, to be honest, I, I found it really interesting. Um, well, my, this, is, this is called Pincushion. Uh, as Kath said, and um, 
really the kind of my work as a whole um, focuses on shining a light on maternal ambivalence and that's a kind of the tension between the sort of motherly need to nurture and feelings of being trapped you know by those feelings and um, my work is informed by the fact that I'm actually a mum of a dependent adult I have a son who's artist autistic he's, he's also very artistic but he's actually autistic and so that kind of puts a slightly different slant on things and that that's really what's informed my work and um, when you're a mother of a dependent adult then the relationship kind of becomes stuck in a dependent phase so despite caring you know very much about my son um, I'm a very kind of mumsy person and I want to support him you know through his journey at to you know hopefully be more independent there's this sort of inner longing to, to loosen the ties. And um, you know, normally um, a child goes up to adulthood and then they, they become more independent. And, and you, um, but when you've got a dependent adult, then they, that doesn't really work. Um, so that's really what my work explores. And um, th this, this piece actually, I'm glad you came to that one first because that, that's the one I've got first in my notes. This is actually a part of a series um, it's here, if you can see it. I can't see myself, so, um, but it's this, this one, it's part of a series. And um, the series are called The, the Troops of Maternal Concern. And, um, and, and that comes from a quote from my own words, um, a galvanize the troops of maternal concern to coax the calm from the storm. And um, the kind of, my son, I said he's autistic, but he's also very articulate and he loves to talk. Um, you know, which is great. And um, we have very long conversations, um, but sometimes the conversations are very, in fact, often the conversations are very repetitive and tedious. And they are, <laughs> I talk too loud, but they're, um, and they're often about the same thing. And one of the topics that he likes to talk about is a group of elderly people that he met while volunteering in Oxfam. He's sort of befriending them and it's, it's all very good. But, um, you know it can be a bit tedious if you're the person that hears the same facts it's very fact-based about um this gentleman again and again you know i know that he got married in iran he's got um he was born in 1946 i think um he's got a wife called annie you know i've got i know all these these same facts and um, it can become very oppressive and i began thinking that in these conversations which i'm very oh okay you know lovely you know because i want to support the language and the conversation um within these conversations i'm going on a bit um there are there are pauses you know where he takes a breath and i began to realize that actually i really relish these pauses as spaces for me and i wanted to find my own words to fill these lulls in the conversation and i actually hand stitched you can see the ribbon um on there i actually hand stitched um my thoughts and feelings and the reason they, these are kind of bodily bobbins and the reason um, they're supposed to be like the, the, the sort of the, the supportive hands that um, yeah, people think that they're supposed to be hands, supportive hands. And um, the reason that they're wound on bobbins is because the words are very personal and, and, and I kind of wasn't quite sure how much I wanted. Somebody else mentioned about things being hidden and in view and I, I only wanted people to have a glimpse of them. Um, I thought I might read, actually, I don't know if I'm going on too much, then tell me to shut up. But I thought I might read, actually, one of them. Um, one of them. I don't even know which one this is, so I'm just going to read it. Um, and then you can sort of um, get, get an idea of it. It's a bit long. Maybe I'll just read a little bit of it. Let's see. Do you actually? I can't find the beginning of a place of da, 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 da. Will it be worth the wait? That's a good, good question. Should have, um, should have done it before, but I wanted you to see because this is that one. I've got some more behind me, but this is actually the one. Um, so uh, these are the unedited. I did actually, I did them as part of my MA um, and I did actually edit them to make them um, more. Oh, I don't know, better for publishing, but these are actually in their raw form, so they can be a little bit repetitive. Right, we're getting there. Okay. So. An erratic, stoically standing on the glacial field of motherhood 
tossed into position almost as an afterthought by the tick of a biological clock now firmly rooted in the need and responsibility that weighs down on it with gravitational force, creeping vegetation, obscuring its form and function, suspended in time and space, a constant in the turmoil of his anxiety. So there we are, but and they're all like, they're kind of like that. They're just kind of like thoughts of, and, and things that I had um, at the time. And anyway, that's, that's those, the, 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 the treats of maternal concern. And the other piece, the pincushion, um, which I, I don't have here because it's actually it's quite exciting because it's in two exhibitions at the same time. It's actually up in Sheffield at the Contemporary Textile Exhibition. But this pincushion is made um, out of um, piece fabrics uh, scraps that have been hand stitched together. They're actually dyed with avocado stones. So um, it, yeah, I do quite a lot of hand dyeing. So, so they're kind of... Um, and the idea is that the pins, if you look closely, the pins actually pierce outward and they kind of allude to the ambivalent feelings that a mother, any mother, but particularly a mother who's got a, a grown up um, disabled child feels. And they're kind of piercing out from, from the internal, very private place out into the public sphere. And which is actually a really good thing. You know, I think sometimes if we got those feelings out more, uh, and kind of owned them, then that would be a good thing. So, um, yeah, that's about releasing the maternal attentions and owning them. So, <laughs> phew, I think I think that might be me. <laughs> Done. Very good. Oh, you didn't hear any of that, did you? Because I was nope. on mute. Okay, let me start again. <laughs> I was doing so well, I got to the last one and then they all fell, fell apart. Oh. Uh, so Cat Quarter works mostly with man-made items which have been either deliberately dumped or lost at sea and highlights the growing problem of waste plastics. Um, I think that raising awareness of these problems, um, such as waste plastic through art, um, this is a great example of drawing the audience in. Um, and it's really, it, it really chimes with the question I asked uh, of all of you artists uh, to see a different perspective. Um, and so um, could you tell us more about the sometimes playful animated imagery you use Kat to communicate your message and what does a day in the life of Kat Coulter look like? Oh, that's, that's, that's a bit scary. <laughs> Um, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Good. Um, well, th this piece uh, I made uh, a couple of years ago, actually, and it's a, a favourite piece that people like it because it's cute and it's a penguin, and but it's made out of a mixture, actually, of man-made items and natural pieces, which I've collected. I haven't altered any of them. I've just assembled them together. Um, and there's flint and shells, but there's also there's glass and pottery and a nice big plastic flute, which uh, none of which should be in the natural environment, but they've just been discarded there. Um, uh, and this piece, um, it talks about what we're doing to our planet. Um, the, 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 little, the little penguin is sitting on a tiny, tiny little scrap of ice. It references uh, the loss of the the ice sheets, I mean, the Antarctic ice sheet is the biggest single piece of ice on the planet and it's eroding as well as, you know, famously the Arctic's eroding, but so is the, the Antarctic. Um, and sort of the dark side of my little piece 
uh, also kind of alludes to uh, there was a bird called the great auk, which wasn't actually a penguin, but a sort of black and white penguin like bird, which was hunted to extinction in the middle of the 19th century, just because it was overexploited and it, it lived in various of North Atlantic uh, places like Iceland and uh, remote areas. And it was just hunted, hunted to death because we wanted to exploit it. Um, so the this little glass dome that uh, the, the penguin is living in, uh, it's reference to the finite, bi finite biosphere of, we've only got so much, we need to look after it. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks cute. Everyone goes, yeah, it's Pingu. But it, um, what, what we're doing to the planet is uh, not quite so cute. Um, so that's a bit about my piece. I don't think you want to know what a day in the, day in the life of me looks like. Um, Am I kind I, of into, with, with your, maybe with your art, perhaps, you know, just sort of when you go out and you kind of, do you decide, well, you, yeah. Well, typically, yeah, you know, I, I will go, I will go out and I, I, I walk by the sea, I collect stuff. Sometimes I have been known to find stuff when I'm actually swimming in the sea as well, but mostly when I'm walking about and I will pick things up and tidy them up or re bring them home and clean them and repurpose them. Uh, people are kind of familiar with, uh, I do, I've recently taken to making cyanotype prints from the things I find, particularly plastics lend themselves terribly well to making cyanotype prints. But I have for years been making my sculptures out of found objects and increasingly the objects that I use, this, my little penguin is a mixture of natural objects and plastics. But frequently now that you, I have pieces which are entirely made from man-made discarded objects. Um, and the amount of plastics that I find over the years is, has been increasing. So we, I don't need statistics and people uh, analyzing it. I, I can just see it um, out, literally outside my house um, and walking on the shore. Um, and it's something that means a lot to me because it I'm right there by the water. I like swimming in the stuff. I'd rather not swim in, uh, swim in a rubbish heap. Um, so it's something that's very important to me. Uh, and uh, on, on good days when it's nice and sunny, if I've got any pa uh, paper ready, I like to make cyanotypes. But otherwise, I'm never happier than sort, sorting through the, the mounds and mounds of stuff that I have create, collected. Uh, it's like it's like it's like grown up Lego. I love it. I, I I look at it and I see forms and some things come ready made. And my little penguin, uh, I just found the pieces and they just all wanted to be together. You think, oh, yeah, I've got a bit there. And and some pieces you keep thinking now this I just need a, something like this to go with it. And you will find endless amounts of stuff. Um, I've got far too much stuff. I will never create all the things <laughs> I have in mind, but, um, and my husband is very tolerant for the amount of storage. Because um, wh when you work with rubbish, if you work with like, beautiful textiles or something, your heaps of your art materials can look kind of quite attractive. But when you look, work with rubbish, you have to be quite careful not to make it just look like a, a rubbish heap. Um, but I try. <laughs> A really important piece Kat thank you so much for taking us through through your your practice um and um yeah thanks so much really a really important piece and um the placement in the exhibition I think it it works really well um so I'm just going to go downstairs now guys and uh just just very quickly talk uh, if you if you can humor me about to my pieces but what I might do is I might just come out of this and just put the sound on quietly um Nick was wanting, and so just uh, just bear with me to see if this works. Um, can you still see my screen? Does it say art can enable audio? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear the sound? Mm. Someone tell me if they can hear the sound. Yeah, we can hear the sound. Okay, You're quite... sound a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit loud. I'm turning it down. I don't want a, a repeat uh, of private view. Okay. Is that, you can still hear it, yeah? Lovely. Okay. So, um, just to end off, I, I know that um, I think a couple of people might want to say a few things. I do have a hard stop at half seven, um, unfortunately. 
Um, so I have two pieces here. Um, this one is called um, Meridian Askew. And um, uh, this is um, a repurposed copper ball pop from a, from a lavatory. I like to um, uh, reuse um, objects. It always has to be like a sculptural element in my work. So my work is like assemblage art, and um, artivism is really important in m most of my work, especially with my sculpture. And since the pandemic, I have been focusing on just sculpture. Things really changed. Um, I was on one path and everything went haywire like it has done for most people. Um, and so I'm now concentrating on sculpture, which I think is just more interesting. It doesn't lie and you can say much more with. Um, so what here is I've um, etched, um, patinated uh, the um, the globe in, in, into this piece. Um, so you can just sort of see uh, here, Africa at the top here. And this is the, 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 the natural join in, in the copper ball cock is actually the meridian. Um, and actually runs straight down through this, um, through, 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 through the west of, of Africa here, and, and you just didn't, you can't really see it, but there's the UK there. Uh, but it would be on an, on an axis, it would be slight, slightly tilted. So uh, hence the title is, it's a skew, and it's a comment on uh, our, 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 our world and the climate being, uh, being a skew. Um, and there's a copper disc at the bottom here. I like to patinate coppers, I uh, patinate uh, metals. I particularly love copper. Um, and um, that's just a sort of, um, I suppose, the world from a different view or the sea or the ocean or whatever. And, and a repurposed uh, trinket box at the bottom with feet, um, which I sanded down and added a rod in the middle and put it all together. Um, actually, the top actually spins on its own. You can actually swizzle it around with your with your hand. I really love to thread, make threads and tap and die and, uh, you know, screw things together. and. And that I love the processes in 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 this kind of work. It, I think the process is actually uh, the most important and fun bit, rather than the end product for me. But there, it has to be a message. So uh, that's that's that one. Um, and then over here, um, we have um, uh, it's actually should be seen from a different angle. Um, this is called Life Force, um, and it's a. Um, so if we just stop it there. Um, we have had a really old uh, cherry tree in our wood that had to be cut down because it was dangerous. It was about to fall over a road and cause, you know, damage and stuff. And so I've had various bells that were cut off. Um, and I like what I like to do with wood, uh, found wood, is leave it outside in the elements. Uh, this piece was left outside for eight months to get the natural sort of patterners, um, the spalting in the wood. Um, and uh, I've left pieces outside for five years. Um, until it nearly is so brittle it falls apart, um, just because I really love, you know, the different sort of uh, patterns. And here, inserted on, on here, is um, it's supposed to resemble a heart. Um, I was, I, when I first started this piece, I started sculpting, you know, a, a heart and working from a model of a heart, um, and it didn't really work. And I just thought, well, you know, the a human heart is a little bit about the same size as, as the palm of your hand, if you held one. So I thought to myself, well, what would it feel like to actually hold a heart? And so I held my hand out and then I cast the, the cast of my hand as if it was holding a cast uh, a heart, sorry. And so that is the um, that is the uh, the imprint of my palms. You can actually go up and, and put your hand around it. Uh, and I thought that that was more interesting, really, than than actually sculpting a heart. Uh, I work with plaster. So there's always like um, there's usually a plaster element, sculpted element which I then cast either in bronze, um, which can be quite expensive. Um, but recently I've, I've learned to have cast my own cold cast metal. So um, it's something really um, a bit more kind of uh, manageable, flexible, doable, and cheaper than actually casting at the foundry. Um, and I'm really enjoying it. So um, this one's called Life, Life Force and it's comment on deforestation um, and um, and how how important and how you know the heart of our world is in the forests and so hopefully i don't need to say more than that um and and, and that's those two pieces um as i said the soundscape in the exhibition is um a recording at the beginning of summertime uh, march 27th i think it was i was you know get gearing up for the exhibition and i went into the we live on a um a steep hill and it's an overgrown wood it's it's really wildlife 
here. We don't really have a garden as such, but we quite like it this way. And I went and crept into the undergrowth and waited and recorded this soundtrack. Um, and it started with bumblebee going by, and that was really nice and different, different birds. Um, and it, it was wonderful, actually, that um, Rita's husband, uh, Rita, who works for Art Count, Rita, let me go on the call, but thank you so much. Her, um, Rita's husband actually identified the different birds, and it was Rita's idea to um, to acknowledge the, the choir at the beginning of the uh, curatorial piece in, in the entrance there. So I think that was a really nice touch. Thank you for that. Um, but I'd just like to say that it, it has got a, a point to it, and it is, is what if, what if we didn't have the, the bees pollinating? What if we didn't have the birds? What if we didn't have all of that? And it's a comment on we really must treat our world differently than what we are. And, you know, just want to say a um, big thank you to everybody for coming today and for listening to all the artists telling us about their work. It's so interesting and for all their hard work in photographing the work because this exhibition is, it's, it's, it's a group effort and it is wonderful, it's amazing and it wouldn't be what it is without all of you. And I just want to say thank you so much. Um, and that's it. And I think we had um, Sabatin wanted to um, perhaps uh, say a few words about his work. I think we might still have time. We think we've got about five, seven minutes if, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, people are still up for it. <laughs> uh, we still have a couple of people uh, here. Um, yeah. So we could we could ju just do this one maybe. Uh, so so this is basically uh, one of my uh, composite pieces. Uh, the base and uh, the top bit are ceramic and. Uh, and so, so they are built around this polystyrene piece that I glued together, saw, and um, melted. So, and uh, so, yeah. I mean, it's uh, so it says when you go around George, and uh, it refers to uh, George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> so, um, I got the idea when I was uh, looking at a catalog by uh, Rodin. So, it's a collaboration with Rodin. <laughs> And um, and I found uh, these uh, people that I knew, uh, a, a marble bust that he had made, and uh, I kind of couldn't really relate to them. They were quite well marble and heavy and all that. So I just thought, if if I would do uh, a bust, how would I do it today? I mean, <laughs> so I came up with this. So instead of marble, I used polystyrene, <laughs> which is also quite durable. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, and uh, the idea was, uh, the, uh, so, so I did uh, two more of these. So one about Baudelaire and the other one about Gustav Mahler. And so, so um, this also is supposed to convey somehow the, the idea of uh, fragility, <laughs> because these three men were not just great, but they had also huge problems. <laughs> so uh, Gustav Mahler, he was a patient of Freud and Baudelaire, he had, uh, I don't know, drug addictions and, and uh, depressions, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, George Bernard Shaw also uh, was quite antagon antagonistic um, with his place and his attitudes towards all sorts of things. So yeah, this was the idea to uh, <clears throat> come up with a, with, a, with a monument that is more honest or kind of uh, honest and at the same time uh, refers to uh, the person's individual biography maybe or um, so so uh, so so the other two Baudelaire looks completely different but it's the same thing I have a, a piece of polystyrene and then I build some uh, <clears throat> ceramic around it or underneath it with with a, and Gustav Mahler the same so it was a challenge for me to uh, first have the polystyrene and then build the ceramic around it, which is quite difficult because you have to make them fit. And as you know, ceramic, when you fire it, it shrinks and you have all these uh, issues. So it was a it was a nice challenge for me as a sculptor. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sabatin. And I should say, you know, we would have loved to have had you in in this talk if we'd known you. We we we, we weren't excluding yeah. any of the artists. Um, no, 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 no. It was we a did put the, the message out to everybody, and that's why not everybody's talked today. Just the artists. Did. But I'm so pleased that you were able to, Sabatin. So thank you so much. And I'm just going to hand back. To, I don't know if Kate, if you're there, if you'd like to say some final words, and maybe she has gone now. I know she had to go. Um, does anybody have anything else they would like to uh, to say? Oh no, she's still there. Kate, are you still there? No problem. If she, I think she might have had to go. She's left it running because we're still recording. So, um, so I'll just say thank you again. <laughs> because it's been amazing and thank you all for talking about your work today and uh, thank you for, for the experience and I really enjoyed uh, curating this show and having having all of you artists in it it was a wonderful experience thank you very much okay. thank you thanks everyone take care speak to you soon bye. have a great thank evening you. bye bye bye, bye, -bye. Very good. Don't know how to leave. <laughs>